Guys, guys all uh, alive, kicking, ready to roll? No? Okay, cool. Whatever. We're, I'm doing it anyways. We're, we're going. Um, I, I don't know if you've read anything about this, but there's, there's a kind of a movement that's happening around the world right now in high tourist destination places. There's kind of like a soft revolt. People that have like high tourism rates, even the ones that depend on the tourism industry, they're starting to get annoyed with certain kinds of tourists. And so they're, they're like, I don't know if you, like Venice, actually there's a, there's a visitor tax if you're gonna go to their city and you don't live there. There's actually a tax, you have to, like you pay a fee just to get into the city to stay wherever you're going to stay because they're trying to actually, they want tourism but they wanna like push away all the tourists, like not all of them, but some of them, they want to like limit it a little bit. Um, I read about, there's a place in Japan where um, there, was, there were so many people stopping on a particular street to look at, I can't remember, it's some mountain or something off in the distance, all these tourists. Then it was like blocking the flow of regular traffic on the sidewalk and things that were going on. They actually put up barriers where you can't see the beautiful scenery outside of the city. Like people go to that city to see that scenery. Um, in Spain, um, there's a, there are certain bus routes that they're, they're taking the public listing off, so you can't find them unless you know about them from being a local because the buses were getting overcrowded with tourists, and then the locals, like the elderly people, couldn't get onto the bus. So there's this, like, there's this weird movement, and what it comes down to for a lot of it is people are really annoying. Like, tourists show up like they own the place, they leave their junk everywhere, they act like the city's there to serve them. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, we, we all know we would never be that way, but other people, when they travel, they're that way, right? And so it's like this, this whole backlash against the way that people are behaving. And so New Zealand has this whole advertising campaign about, basically, they're like trying to recruit the kinds of tourists that they want to come to their country. Um, there's this, it, it's a whole thing that's happening right now. And I would only know that because of the beauty of the internet. Um, you know, great way to waste your time and find out about weird little micro trends that are happening in the world that nobody else cares about. But here, here's the deal. When, when we were, we're in this series on relationships. And, you know, you look at the tourism industry and, and people are, there's, there's, again, backlash against a certain kind of tourist, people that don't behave well. They litter. They're not kind. They don't care about the other people around them. They're in it for themselves. When we talk about our relationships, I remember when our kids were really little, we used to say to them all the time, if you want to have friends, you have to be a friend first. You can't just wait for other people to come to you and expect them, well, what kind of friend are they going to be to me? You have to go, well, what kind of friend am I being towards other people? I can't control how other people are towards me, but if I behave in certain ways, I will most likely attract a certain kind of person to me. And so if I learn to be a good friend to other people, then I'll probably end up having good, reliable, trustworthy friends in my life. I mean, pretty sound advice, right? But pretty basic, right? But yet, when we become adults, it becomes a little bit more difficult for us to wrap our minds around that sometimes. And he, Jesus even um, was, was trapped at one point, not trapped, people around were trying to trap him with questions. And they were saying, you know, well, you, you say that we have to love our neighbor as ourselves." And they said, well, who's my neighbor? Like, who am I required to love? And Jesus went on this whole parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. He tells this whole story. And what Jesus does, the, the main thing in that parable, he flips it on its head. And the question that was being asked is, who is my neighbor? Who am I required to love? And the whole story Jesus tells is about how are you being a good neighbor to people around you? Not who's your neighbor that you're required to love, but how are you the kind of person that you need to be to the world around you? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Because as we look at our relationships, our marriages, our children, or the next generation that comes behind us, whether they're our children or not, whether we look at, you know, we look at our community and the, you know, the, the friendship structures that we have um, in our lives, the question that we have to come back to over and over again is what kind of friend are we? Who are we becoming? How are we treating the people around us? Everything has to start with that. Um, and we're going to look at one character in the Bible in particular this morning um, to dive into that. But I want to read a, a passage from Philippians chapter 2. Um, the Apostle Paul wrote this, and this is what he said about the way that we're supposed to behave, what our posture towards the world around us is supposed to be. He says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, and this will kind of frame our discussion this morning. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, 
but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. I love and hate that verse simultaneously. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfishness. I'm like, nothing? <laughs> that's, that's a pretty broad category here that we're talking. I can't do anything out of selfish ambition. Nothing out of me thinking that I'm better than others or that my time is more valuable than somebody else's time. That's a really hard standard to live up to. And yet it's laid out there in scripture that that's, that's the posture of Jesus towards us. He humbled himself for our sake and we're to humble ourselves for the sake of other people around us. There's a great example of somebody who lived this out really well in the scriptures and his name is Barnabas. And I want to, we're gonna kind of just, you, you, you pick up bits and pieces of his story through the book of Acts. And so I wanna just, I wanna just sort of follow Barnabas at some key points in his life where we find his story. He's not a major player in the New Testament, but he, he's key, but he's not one of the, you know, he's not Paul. Um, he's, he's not Jesus. He's not Peter. Um, but he plays key parts in the kingdom of God. And so as he shows up, I want to kind of track with him and let's look at who he is and see how he embodies what Paul said to live our lives with selfishness not being the driving factor, to do things instead in humility and consider others better than ourselves, to empty ourselves the way that Jesus emptied himself for the sake of other people. So we, Barnabas first comes on the scene in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. It says this, For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a, f he sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Okay, I want you to stop and think about this. His name is Joseph. I don't know what Joseph means, but his name is Joseph. And he gets a nickname from the leaders in the church, and the nickname is Barnabas. And the reason why they call him Barnabas is because it literally means son of encouragement. Barnabas was so encouraging, breathes, to encourage somebody means literally to put courage into them. Like you're breathing life into them. Your, your presence around them, the words that you speak, the way that you behave towards them, it's, it's literally lifting them up. It's encouraging them. It's strengthening them. It's making them stronger. It's making them better. And they literally nicknamed him based off of that. Like, what if you were nicknamed off of your most recognizable trait? <laughs> like, would we be proud of those nicknames? Or would we be like, uh, you know, like, oh yeah, that's old stingy over there. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's old crabby pants. Uh, you know, whatever. Like, you, you, would it be that? Or would it be something like, he's a son of encouragement. He's cheerful. He's generous towards other people. You know, what would be the descriptors in our life? What would be the things that people would, would nickname us based off of? So he's obviously some kind of a stand-up guy, and everybody probably really likes him. Um, we don't have a ton of information about him, um, but he shows up in the book of Acts in the beginning, and he makes it about halfway through the book of Acts, and then he just disappears, and we don't know what happens to him. We don't know how it ends for him. We don't know the rest of his story. But the impact that he had on the early church and on us today is, is huge. And that's what I want to kind of point out to you. So there's four things about his life that I want us to, to, to glean from this morning. Uh, the four things that we can learn from him, these are ways that he encouraged, but it's the way that he interacted with other people that put courage into them, that strengthened them and made them better. The first thing is he invested in others with his generosity. He invested in others with his generosity. If you, you know, saw in that passage that we just read, it said we're, they're introducing us to him. And he's called Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and it says at the end of it that, <clears throat> that he sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. So in other words, he sold a piece of property and took the entire proceeds, everything that he made on that investment, and brought it and gave it to the church. Like, I think I'm a pretty generous guy. I, I, like, I want to be generous, okay? It, 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 it's like, it's a, it's a priority for me. It's a value for me. And yet still, 
I will find myself in the moment of writing the check or, or now, you know, punching in the numbers online to give, to give a large amount to something that we sense the Lord telling us or to give a small amount, but I just don't maybe necessarily want to give it in that moment. Like I find myself going like, well, do I, I mean, do I need to really give this much? Like we could dial this back just a little bit and then we could do these other things with that and it would end up benefiting the kingdom in the long run because, and I can like justify my way, you know, out of generosity very easily. You don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, does anybody feel that? Like it's super easy to talk ourselves out of generosity, even if it's a priority. And we got the value on the wall. Like you look at it, I mean, it's, we got it out there in the lobby. One of our five core values as a church is that we as CLF, as a movement, we are extravagantly generous. We fight hard to make sure that our, our stuff, our lives, our time, everything, our resources, we hold it with open hands. We recognize that it's all a gift from the Lord. And so we don't close our fists on it and hang on to it tight, but we give it away freely. But when the rubber meets the road, it's easier said than done, isn't it? And Barnabas in this moment, I'm assuming he's making a profit on this investment or he's cutting his losses and he's losing money on the investment. Either way, it's not easy to do that to sell an investment and then go, I'm going to give all of it. And it was going towards the ministry of the church. Whatever needed to be taken care of, there were needs within the church at that time. And he was laying it at the apostles' feet going, listen, I, I trust you. I'm letting go of this to do with, with it what you will. He's generous towards other people. He's leveraging his own resources for the sake of other people. He's not holding on to it just for himself, but he's giving it away to the best of his ability. And generosity for us, I mean, it's our possessions, it's, you know, our bank accounts, but it's also our time, right? It's our energy. It's the skills that we possess, the experience that we have. To learn to leverage those things for other people, we're called to be those kinds of people. We're called to steward the life that we have and, and do just that, steward it. It's, it's not, according to the scripture, it's not my life to live and it's not your life to live. It's, it's a life that God has given to you and you, he's entrusted it to you and you steward it for his purposes and for his kingdom. And so how he wants you to invest yourself, your time, your talents, your treasure, all of it, it all comes back to him. And generosity puts stinginess in its place. It's why when we talk about giving here, it's why we say all the time, listen, it is wise to come up prayerfully with a percentage of your income that you're going to give. It's wise, Carrie was referencing it, you know, we got different ways that you can give and different, you know, we, like it's wise to have a plan for how you're going to give. It's wise to have a rhythm and to have a schedule. Why? Because when we go at it just willy-nilly, like just, well, what do I... Mm, what do I feel like doing today? We end up thinking that we're a lot more generous than we actually are. We feel like we're, we're, we're pinching ourselves more than we actually are. And so there's wisdom in us going, listen, there's a percentage of my income. I've prayed about it. I've come up with a plan. This is how I give. This is where I give. This is the types of causes that I give to. The church should be one of those things, but it probably shouldn't be the only thing that we're given to. These are the people that I support. These are the things that I'm engaged in. We have to have a plan for that or else generosity, stinginess will choke it out. It's a constant battle for all of us. And so uh, for, for me, for our family, putting that rhythm where we give on a weekly, we give on a monthly basis every month. This is when we give. This is the percentage of our income that we give. And so if we get an increase, if we, if we have some sort of a profit that we make, that same percentage gets applied to that profit that we made. It's like we're, it, it leaves no room for us to weasel out of the generosity. We've prayerfully agreed on the terms of our generosity and the Lord can change it at any point, but we don't change it unless he tells us to. We bring it before him. We go, is this still what you want me to do? Open-handed? And he's like, yes. No, I want you to increase it. It's weird. God rarely decreases it. I'm, you know, I'm not saying that hasn't happened in different seasons, but, <laughs> but putting generosity in place, it, it checks that stinginess in our hearts. And learning to put a rhythm in our life of giving not only our resources, but also giving our time and our energy and our talent, it puts a stinginess with our life in its place, and it helps us put into practice what, 
what Paul said, to not do anything out of selfish ambition, to not do anything because we're trying to get ahead, to not do anything because we think that we're better or we're more deserving than other people, but instead to place them in a position of priority. So Barnabas invested in others with his generosity. He was wise with his life. And you'll see that played out in some different ways. Um, <clears throat> the next time we read about him is in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 26. And, and what's happened at this point is the church is being persecuted, the early church. And there's all kinds of pressure being exerted and kind of the ringleader of that pressure that's being exerted, that persecution, is a guy whose name is Saul. His name ends up getting changed to Paul. But his name is Saul and he's, he's watching as Christians are being murdered and celebrating it. He's running around the countryside, locking up, jailing, throwing in prison anyone that's in leadership within the church, anyone he can sniff out. He's trying to snuff out the movement of the church. And then he has this radical encounter with the Lord where God shows up and blinds him. And this powerful man who's persecuting everybody else is rendered completely inept. And he's crawling around on the ground and he can't see and the Lord is speaking to him. And he's saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He has this radical encounter with the Lord. His life is turned upside down. He goes from being the, the, the biggest thorn in the side of the church to becoming one of the leaders in the church. But in that in-between time, he ends up getting healed and he's not blind anymore. And the Lord tells him to join the church. Do you think the church was interested in having Saul join their gatherings? He's like, he's been throwing them all in prison. He's been watching as they're murdered and celebrating it. And now he's like, hey, can I come worship with you guys? And they're all like, yeah, that's not happening. He's like, no, I'm a changed man, I swear. And they're like, look, we're not idiots. We weren't born yesterday. This would be an easy tactic for you to get into the fellowship of believers and figure out who the key players are and try to snuff out the leadership, and nobody's buying it. And this is where we find Barnabas, again, shows up. It says about Paul in Acts 9, 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. He had gone from trying to stamp out the name of Jesus to proclaiming the name of Jesus in public powerfully for anyone who would listen. And so, based on Barnabas' vouching for him and advocating for him, Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. There's a key piece in that story. It says, Paul tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him because they didn't think that he was really a disciple. And then it says, but Barnabas. The whole story pivots because Barnabas steps in. And Barnabas takes his reputation. Now we're not just talking about generosity and giving courage by words or generosity with funds based off an investment. We're talking about the generosity of leveraging our position, our name, our reputation for the sake of other people. But it's more than that. I want you to think about this. Barnabas was, he was in the early church from the very beginning. When, you get meant, when your name gets dropped in Acts chapter 4, you've been there from the beginning, right? It would make sense then that he knows people who have been killed by Paul and his cronies. He knows people who have been drug off into prison that are possibly still in prison at that time because of Paul and the work that he had done. And yet Barnabas moves past that. Barnabas was quick to forgive. He was quick to let go of offense. He was quick to drop the rock in his hand that he wanted to use to throw at somebody else and to give a second chance. And not just give a second chance like, look, I forgive you for what you did, but I'm not doing anything more than that. I'm not required to do anything more than that. 
except for we are required to do more than that. Jesus said that we're supposed to be the kind of people who, when we're asked to go one mile, we go two. When the requirement, the base requirement is this, grace pushes us past that baseline requirement and it pushes us to something greater. And we might be required to forgive, but we don't have to like that person. But grace causes us to move from forgiveness to actually leveraging our reputation and putting our name on the line for other people. These are the kinds of people that we're called to be. You want to have good friends? Be a good friend first. You want to have deep relationships for other, with other people? Be quick to forgive. Be quick to leverage what you have for the sake of of others. The third thing that we can learn from Barnabas is that he was willing to play second fiddle. He was willing to play second fiddle. Here's here's a story that'll illustrate this really well. So persecution, which Paul was a part of, actually ended up scattering the church. It sent all the believers out of Jerusalem. They were all holed up in Jerusalem. And if you remember, this is kind of interesting. If you remember, when Jesus was getting ready to ascend to heaven, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, right? In Acts 1.8, he said, go into, like make disciples, go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Those are concentric circles moving outward from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. But Christians wanted to just hang out together in their own, like it was fun. It was good. We love each other, and there's lots of really good things happening, and it was beautiful. They didn't want to move, and what ends up happening is persecution gets stirred up, and now all of a sudden, these believers get forced into doing what God had originally told them to do in the first place. They started moving out from Jerusalem into Judea and into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's why Saul was actually on his way to Damascus when he had the encounter with the Lord is because the believers had scattered to avoid the persecution that he had stirred up, and now there are more pockets of believers springing up in all these outlying areas, and he's trying to go to these outlying, er- these outlying areas and to snuff those out as well, right? So the, the church has been scattered, and as they're being scattered, um, what Satan meant for harm, God actually turns it for good. And now the church is spreading and it's becoming a movement that would end up becoming a global movement, but it started because of persecution. And so in Acts chapter 11, as the believers are being persecuted and they're scattering and then they're sharing their faith with other people and they're making disciples the way Jesus told them to, people are coming to faith and the church is actually growing in these cities. And in Acts 11 verse 19, it says, meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death which Paul was standing there holding everyone's jackets while they were um, murdering Stephen, they all traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. Again, what's interesting here is it says earlier in Acts that when the believers were scattered, all the believers were scattered out of Jerusalem except for the leaders of the church, except for the apostles. So these are not the trained vocational ministers that are out preaching the word to everyone as they're being scattered. It's everybody. It's not the people that are used to being on the platform, being in a teaching role. It's normal believers, everyday followers of Jesus who are explaining the good news of Jesus. It's a mandate for all of us. That's how the kingdom of God moves forward. That's an aside. But it says that they're preaching to the Gentiles, uh, they, they're, they're preaching to, uh, only to the Jews. However, verse 20, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, about the Lord Jesus. And the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles, non-Jews, believed and turned to the Lord. Now, this was new. In the beginning, it was only the Jewish people coming to Jesus. And then it slowly started branching out into non-Jewish folks that started coming to salvation in Jesus. And in verse 22, it says, when the church at Jerusalem, kind of the mothership, heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Hey, there's this new move that's happening, and there's actually non-Jewish people in large numbers. We've seen small numbers, but now we're seeing large numbers that are coming to Jesus as a result of the word of God going out. Who, we need to send somebody to kind of check in on it. Who can we trust? Who's trustworthy? Barnabas. Let's send Barnabas to go check in Antioch what's going on. 
Verse 23, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Listen, so the gospel went to the Jews first, and then after that it went to the Gentiles, and the early church sends Barnabas to check it out. He speaks life to them, encourages them, and what happens? The church is flourishing while he's there. There's growth that's happening because Barnabas is there pouring water on the seeds and scattering seeds himself. There are good things that are happening. And listen, it says that there are great numbers of people that came to faith. This was Barnabas' moment. For years, he's been a minor player. For years, he's been a name that's in Acts, but he's not James, and he's not Peter, and he's not Paul. And now he's on the scene at this like fresh move and he's a part of amazing things happening. This is a perfect chance for him to set up the first church of St. Barnabas at Antioch. This is the first church for him to go. It's a global ministry. He's got a platform. He can do it. He can expand his territory all for Jesus, but he can expand it and he can be at the core of everything that's going on. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. But that's not what Barnabas does. That's not who he was. He saw what was happening, and he realized that it was more than just what he could handle. And so we actually find, just a couple of verses later, in Acts eleven twenty five, it says, Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul, Paul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Listen, Paul, uh, Barnabas was not afraid to play second fiddle. He was not interested in pecking orders. He was interested in the kingdom of God advancing. He was not interested in his own fame and his own renown and his own reputation. He was interested in leveraging whatever he had for the good of other people around him and for the glory of God. That was it. That was it. And what's interesting here is up until this point in the book of Acts, every time Barnabas' name is mentioned with somebody else's name, it's Barnabas and Paul went and did this. Barnabas and these people did these things. And after this point, anytime Barnabas' name is mentioned, it's mentioned second. Paul and Barnabas went here and did this. This person and Barnabas showed up and did these things. And there's no record, there's no mention of Barnabas throwing a fit. There's no mention of, I put in the time, I made the sacrifices, I made the, he's leveraged his finances for the church. He's leveraged his reputation for the church. He's gone and done whatever task they sent him to do. Hey, Barnabas, we need somebody to go into Syria. I know it's kind of a long ways and that's sort of inconvenient, but we know you're a good guy and you'll go along with it, so why don't you go take care? Like he's, he's done whatever has been asked of him. And the kingdom of God expands because of it. And that's all that he cared about. So he's not afraid to play second fiddle. He was willing to play whatever role Jesus had for him. It's almost as if he believed what Jesus said when Jesus said that the way to lead is to serve. That the way to love is to empty ourselves of ourselves. The way to interact with other human beings correctly is what we read in Philippians. To not do anything out of selfish ambition but instead consider others better than ourselves, to empty ourselves in the same way Jesus. It's like he took Jesus at his word and followed Jesus' example beautifully. The fourth thing that we can learn from Barnabas is that he gave second chances. He gave the benefit of the doubt. And this is similar to him leveraging his reputation. It's similar to him forgiving. But you'll see there's a little bit of a difference. There's a progression of verses in Acts chapter 12, verse 25. It says, when Barnabas and Saul, see the name, what order it's in? When Barnabas and Saul, it's going to shift after this story. 
When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. John Mark was a young man, and he was around the church in Jerusalem, and they must have seen some leadership potential in him, some some potential for him to develop, and so they pulled him alongside themselves, and they, they, they were in Jerusalem, and then they went back out on their missionary journeys, and they took John Mark with them. And in Acts 13, 3, it says that Paul and his companions, Barnabas isn't even mentioned by name at this point, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. And there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Returned to Jerusalem. Nothing's explained. It's just they go out on this missionary journey, they bring John Mark with them, and then at some point in the middle of the journey, John Mark turns back and goes back home. And we don't know the reason, we don't know anything except for in Acts chapter 15, after Barnabas and uh, Paul have finished this missionary journey, and they've come back into Jerusalem, and they're getting ready to go back out on another missionary journey together. Uh, In Acts 15, 36, it says, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Verse 38, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them. So we get a little bit of a hint. This wasn't a real good thing that John Mark did. He dipped out. They felt like they were deserted by him. John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. This, they're like, hey, let's go back out. Okay, we're in agreement. Barnabas goes, let's take John Mark again. And Paul goes, are you kidding me? He's dead weight. It was a waste of resources. It was a waste of time. There's no way I'm bringing that kid. And Barnabas goes, yeah, I think we should take him. And Paul's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And I'm so thankful that the scriptures include that they had a strong disagreement. It says they had a strong disagreement. And then it says their disagreement was so sharp that these two men who had labored together for years and years and years decided to go their separate ways and go, listen, we don't see eye to eye on this. We need to go our separate ways. Paul takes Silas, Barnabas takes John Mark, and they go in different directions, and they do kingdom work. Listen, this is the enemy's, one of the enemy's number one tools in trying to slow down the movement of the kingdom of God is disunity. And one of the main ways that he stirs up disunity is conflict that's handled poorly when we don't know how to deal with conflict with other believers, we're not willing to sit down and have a strong disagreement and a sharp dispute, and even if it means we go our separate ways, we can go our separate ways in love. We can go our separate ways still respecting. I can still disagree with the person, but, but I respect them, and I love them, and we can actually move in different directions. I'm grateful that not everything in the New Testament is like, oh, it's all you know, cupcakes and rainbows and gumdrops and unicorns and everything was amazing and then we would find ourselves living today and being like, well, how are we supposed to do that? We can't ever live up to that example. There's the example of things going wrong, but it's handled well. In our friendships, in our workplaces, in our marriages, the Lord's desire is for you and I to learn to use, uh, like to work through conflict in the healthiest way possible. This is why Jesus prayed against disunity for his followers. Again, almost always the disunity within the body of Christ, it's coming from conflict that's handled poorly. You know what's interesting? So Barnabas gives John Mark a second chance, and Paul doesn't want to do it. And what's interesting is uh, later on in Paul's life, we don't hear from Barnabas anymore. That's the last that we hear from. He goes a separate way with John Mark, and then he's not mentioned, and Paul's all over the place in Acts. And it would be easy to be like, well, we know which one got it right. Paul got it right because his star kept rising, and Barnabas got it wrong. He's not heard of anymore, like went into obscurity. But what's really interesting is Paul, later on at the tail end of his ministry, he's writing in 2 Timothy 4.11. Timothy's his protege. He actually says to Timothy, only Luke is with me. 
get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. At some point, Barnabas, after giving a second chance to John Mark and continuing to leverage what he had for the sake of other people, John Mark got over the hump of whatever it was in his leadership, and Paul had had run-ins with him and spent time with him at some point to the point where in one of his letters he said, he's actually helpful to me in my ministry. Can you send, I'm sending for him, I'm requesting for him. That help that Paul got from John Mark would not have happened if Barnabas wouldn't have been giving second chances. If Barnabas wouldn't have been willing to look for potential where other people just saw failure. What kind of a friend are we? What kind of a mentor are we? What kind of a boss are we? What kind of a coworker are we? What kind of a spouse are we? What kind of a parent, a child? H- how are we? Are we walking out what we're told the example of Jesus is? To empty ourselves. To not do things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but to consider others better than ourselves. Because If we will learn to live that way, the impact in our homes, the impact in our neighborhoods, the impact in our communities, the impact in our schools, the impact in our workplaces and in our businesses, it will be off the charts. Think about this. Because of what Barnabas did, he leveraged his reputation for the Apostle Paul, who was not the Apostle Paul. He was Saul, who was murdering people. But he leveraged his reputation and put his name on the line and put his stamp on him. And Paul was unable to catch on with the early church until that happened. And then because of Barnabas, he catches on with the early church and he rises into leadership. And Paul planted dozens and dozens of churches all along the Mediterranean Sea. He would end up, by the power of the Holy Spirit, penning roughly half of the New Testament that now shapes our lives. Would that have happened if Barnabas wouldn't have leveraged himself for the sake of Paul? Think about this. He gave second chances and saw potential in John Mark when nobody, including the Apostle Paul, Little did he know that not only would John Mark end up benefiting Paul's ministry in the future and other church leaders, but John Mark would go on to write the Gospel of Mark that we now read. And Barnabas would have had no idea that that was going to happen because he was a kid at that time. The impact of his life, it's immeasurable. Imagine with me what it would look like for you and for me, for us as a movement in our community to live our lives in this way, what kind of change could we bring to those around us? What kind of change could we make in our homes? What kind of change could we make in our families? What kind of change could we make in our community? I love, uh, the first, some of these insights, the first time I ever heard them was uh, Dean Anderson, who was the lead pastor here for a bazillion years. I have to say that because like half the people here don't even know who he is anymore. And Dean served here faithfully for decades and decades. And then when it came time for him to retire, Dean, in humility, he could have kept pastoring, but he sensed that it was time for others to step into leadership. And he graciously stepped out of the lead role. You talk about being willing to play second fiddle. He stepped out of the lead role graciously and put all the weight of his reputation and everything that he could give behind Carrie and I and our leadership in this church and has been nothing but loving and support, supporting to us over the years. And, and some of the first time I heard some of this stuff, some of the connections here with Barnabas was actually him teaching it. And when he taught it, I went back in some of his old sermon notes, he said this, so I'm quoting Dean. Uh, <clears throat> he says, greatness is not found in having your name in lights, or how many people are aware of your exploits. Greatness is found in how you serve others. How many stand on your shoulders taller than you stand, seeing more than you see and doing more than you did. 
what would our community, what would our church family, what would this world look like if you and I took serious the commands of Scripture, took serious the example of Jesus, and we followed in those footsteps? I can tell you this, we might not know all the specifics, but it'll be better than what it is right now. Let's endeavor to live that way. That's the Lord's desire for us in all of our relationships. So, would you stand to your feet? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We're grateful for the example of Jesus. We're grateful for the example of Barnabas. We're grateful for the witness of, of Scripture to teach us, to train us, to shape us, to conform us in your image and not in the image of the world around us. God, we pray, make us people who do not fight and scratch and claw for our own sake, but God, that we would fight for the sake of others. God, shape us into a movement of people who leverage our gifts and our abilities, our resources, our experiences, for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of the good around us. God, make us your hands and your feet, your agents of blessing in our marriages, with the next generation, in our circles of friendships, in our workplaces, in the places where we serve in our community. God, use us as catalysts for your good. And we pray for that. God, anoint us by your spirit. We pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Glad that you guys decided to join us. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.